And now we move into the realms of the union of spirit and matter. It's time to make our divided selves whole again. Separate the earth from the fire. Solvate coagula. In alchemy, we have a very sacred science for bringing the lead of an undeveloped consciousness up to the level of a fully developed consciousness of gold, magnificent and incorruptible. In this, one can see past the allegory of symbols and cryptic artwork commonly associated with alchemy. The great work is filled with some of the most spectacular symbolism ever created and seen in our time. Deciphering them and applying them to ourselves displays one of the greatest secrets ever to be revealed. In previous films, we have examined the basic principles of alchemy, which would be expanded on in greater detail here. One of the most important symbols in alchemy is that of the Philosopher's Stone. While it may not be as well known, its significance cannot be taken lightly. The symbol of the stone can be used as a key in order to aid in the decrypting of alchemical imagery and lend meaning to many other symbols. The stone itself, in many ways, is indeed a key. But what exactly is the meaning of this symbol? The generally accepted explanation seems to be that of describing the relationship between the physical and spiritual realms and our part in that relationship. In the stone, we can be seen as a divine being encased in matter with the intent of performing work on the physical plane. This work is nothing short of being able to exist beyond the material world. A consciousness perfected as a stone by doing the work needed to achieve it the great work. By working with the constituent parts represented by this symbol and bring them together as a whole, we come into union with that which is the whole, the one. We will now go through some basic aspects to understand the process of the great work, which began with the one, or as it's sometimes referred to as, the all. Please take note as we begin. This is not about religion or established dogma or creed, this is about advanced spiritual science, pure and simple. Therefore, when we mention the one or the all, it may or may not be directly referring to deity, but rather to the creative force which encompasses all that is and is not. The one is everything, every potentiality, every outcome. It is the divine principle and prima materia. The one is alpha and omega, the beginning and the end of the great work, and in this is sometimes represented by the Ouroboros. This is one of the most perplexing and fulfilling aspects to fully understand, and many of us spend a lifetime attempting to do so. In this principle, we examine the concept of duality. In alchemy, we see what is perhaps one of the most easily understood depictions of duality from all traditions. This is seen as the sun and the moon, or Sol and Luna, sulfur and mercury, or the red king and the white queen. This is found throughout that entire attempt to describe the law of opposites, male, female, light, dark, active, passive, and high and low. In Eastern traditions, we see this as yin and yang of the Tao. Surely, aspects of the nature of duality are no accident or coincidence. These are sometimes represented in alchemical imagery as two opposing dragons. One is winged or volatile, one is wingless or fixed. Although we have opposing forces that represent separation, they seek union and to be in balance and harmony. For the alchemist, they strive to reconcile these differences within themselves and create this union. This is done through a process known as solvate coagula, to separate the pure from the impure, the subtle from the gross in the emerald tablet. When done properly and in sufficient repetition, the two can come together perfected as one, 
This is represented as the perfect matter in the androgene or hermaphrodite in alchemical imagery. Alchemists see this principle as tria prima, or the three primes. These are mercury, sulfur, and salt, or spirit, soul, and body. When the two opposing principles of sulfur, masculine, and mercury, feminine, come together, we get the salt or body, which brings together and reconciles these opposing principles within it in order to exist on the material plane in physical form. In the great work, the alchemists work with the three primes in the same process spoke of earlier, solvate coagula, which is interpreted as dissolve and coagulate. This dissolving is done to free the soul and body, or sulfur and salt, using mercury or spirit. In this way, the soul and body can be calcined or purified and rejoined or bound with spirit, making it one again, free from imperfections. All things which exist contain these three principles. The four commonly known aspects are fire, water, air, and earth as elements, which correspond to the current scientific knowledge of plasma, liquids, gas, and solids. In Kabbalah, these are known as Yod, He, Vav, He, or Jehovah. The fire is our will, the life force or Chi as it is seen in Eastern traditions. The water is our emotions and describes how they can easily flow from one temperature to the next when not under control. The air is our intellect and the earth is our body or matter here on the material plane. These four aspects encompass many things and can be used to easily identify areas of our personality which needs refined and how. Balance between these aspects is the key, and when one aspect is lacking, it can be balanced with another as an opposite. All of this builds towards a fully integrated self, capable of refraining from one extreme of the spectrum. In alchemy, the concept of spirit is seen of having great importance. It is viewed as the fifth or additional element to the original four. Modern science at some points accept this concept and views the fifth element to be what is known as ether, whereas the alchemist knows this element as the quintessence. The quintessence is not only the glue which binds all elements together, it is also seen as what keeps the elements independent of each other. In Kabbalah, this is also known as Shin, which has a quality of fire, and is generally placed right in the middle as Yod, He, Shin, Vav, He. Now that we have reviewed some of the basic alchemical concepts, let's move on and delve deeper into the process. Although alchemical processes can be applied to a variety of things, this film is primarily focused on the alchemist him or herself being the experiment. This is solidified under the credo, as above, so below, which is essentially describing the relationship of the macrocosm to the microcosm. Consider sacred geometry using the Fibonacci series which produces the same shape in both pine cones and galaxies. With this, the alchemist can work with things on the material plane and learn more about the properties of the spiritual plane or vice versa. The great work begins in the stage known as nigrado, or the blackness. With our consciousness as the prima materia is where we find ourselves in the current condition, as the lead in the alchemical allegory. With spirit, we can dissolve and place our prima materia into the athenor or chemical furnace and begin the calcination process and eliminate any energies which may be blocking growth. Nigrado can be a very powerful stage as it often signifies a point in one's life where a spiritual evolution is necessary or imminent. It is unfortunate, however, knowing that the material plane cannot fulfill and the seeking of spiritual truth is an inevitable and required event. In the illustration, take note of the black crow or raven in the setting, signifying undergoing the stage of nigrado. This is a very personal time, where you may begin to look deep into the soul, no matter how uncomfortable it may be at first. There is some debate about if the next stage, known as the cauda pavones or the peacock's tail, is actually placed after albedo or nigrado. Perhaps it may be different for some individuals, however, for the purposes of this discussion, we will describe this stage here. Out of the whiteness, clarity begins to occur and the alchemist can experience all of the aspects of the whiteness as one because unity is found. 
as Isaac Newton showed us with his prism work, that whiteness that enters from above and can be broken down and seen in all of its brilliant display of colors. We, as divine beings, are the prism. This may be a euphoric experience for the alchemist, as new energies and knowledge not previously experienced come into play. When the peacock's tail emerges and the discipline is established, it signifies the alchemist is entering the next stage, known as albedo. To experience and understand the following stage, known as albedo, one generally must have fully immersed in nigredo, having looked deep within themselves. The source of all existence appears through the void and is seen as a whiteness or a bright light. This occurs due to the understanding of unity in all polarities and is seen as the one. In this, the alchemist knows the source from which everything sprang and is aware of the real beauty of the spiritual path in becoming this unification once again. As was mentioned earlier concerning the two opposing forces, this can be seen as the hermaphrodite or mercury, which is spirit. Spirit has no gender and is associated with pure consciousness. As albedo continues, spirit begins to coagulate with matter and the volatile is becoming fixed. This is done when our conscious mind peers deep into the subconscious and brings it back to the conscious mind to be observed. Spirit is entering the soul, purifying and coagulating to become solidified and constant in our life. This is when we actually begin to work with spirit and put to action on the material plane, culminating in the formation of the diamond body. Similar to the resurrection of Christ, this can be seen as a solid body of light, purified and incorruptible. These have merely been brief descriptions of alchemical stages one may experience on their path and is primarily intended for providing reference for further material at a later time. Hopefully this has given an adequate review for some and a summary for others. Some of you are practicing alchemists and some of you have only just discovered the art. One of the most beautiful aspects of alchemy is that it doesn't matter what stage of development you are currently experiencing. It will take your temperature and prescribe you a most relevant remedy. At this time, it is appropriate to mention one of the reasons for secrecy in this sacred art. If you are seriously considering undertaking the great work, please keep in mind that this is not a journey for the weary. One should take into account the things being said here for developing in a healthy and balanced way. This is important for several reasons, especially of which concerns your health and the health of others. If you are not ready to face what may be sitting dormant in your subconscious, then you should proceed with caution as they will without a doubt emerge through the alchemical process. Alchemy is able to take you where you need to go, but you need to be ready to go there and confront them once and for all. This may seem trivial at first, but it needed to be said so there can be understanding of the road ahead. Until you are well versed in the creation of elixirs and medicine, do not ingest or have others ingest what you have created. This even includes what may be seen as a harmless herb used in plant alchemy, for example. Some of them may have negative effects if used improperly. It is important that you are entering your study of alchemy with the proper intentions. Do not be seeking after material treasures, social status, or psychic abilities. Come to alchemy with an open mind, an open heart, and open hands, free from any expectations, and allow the natural process to reveal and unfold for you. One of the fundamental aspects of where your journey begins is with observation, which is your complete attention on your thoughts, on your feelings, and on your actions. Begin just by placing your total attention on what you are thinking right now, on what you are feeling right now, or what you are doing right now. Start with one at a time, and don't place too much emphasis on accomplishing all three at once, as they are also helping you determine which one of the three you are most receptive to. What is most important is the length of time you are able to keep your attention on a thought or feeling, even to the point where you are observing the transition from one thought to another. These are key moments, as they are frequently a time when attention is broken. Learn to notice signs that the attention is falling away, and bring your conscious mind back to observing that thought or feeling. Now is the time to be honest with yourself, or there will be little growth. The purpose of observation is increased self-awareness. While its benefits are obvious, you are about to be aware of all aspects, 
and that frequently means things that you do not like about a thought, feeling, or action. Try to notice if it's originating from the self or the ego. Is it a need or is it a want? Now that your full attention is placed on it, as difficult as it may sound, accept it, embrace it, and view it from an outward perspective. This is what separates everyday life with alchemy, which you are aware and you plan to take action upon it. An alchemist should always welcome these energies, find an alternative energy to give it new form, and transmute it through an opposing principle. This is where the recognition and utilization of archetypes can be beneficial, as you will soon be met with resistance to changes you know are beneficial to the self. This resistance occurs from the ego. This may be one of the first times that you have allowed illumination of consciousness onto your ego personality, and as you can imagine, it is beginning to feel a bit threatened. The ego is a survival mechanism which is built in, and in many cases really does feel it has its best intentions in mind. Develop your ego so that it becomes flexible, and allows itself to be molded by your conscious input from the self as well. To assist in the transmutation, bring into the consciousness and utilize an archetype which represents a principle of opposition. Through a process known as sublimation, you will connect your internal opposing principles together in order to change or transmute one energy signature to another. Aspects of your personality have a polar opposite, especially for new initiates an opposing principle has the ability to efficiently provide balance. More advanced or strong-willed alchemists may have the ability to transmute directly through the application of fire or will. You may have heard of this in different terms by others who may employ it, sometimes even for financial gain. The names they frequently go by are neurolinguistic and neuroassociative programming, the secret, or something similar. But they all employ one idea that has been utilized for millennia. Thoughts, feelings, and actions can be interrupted and replaced with a more favorable alternative. The most efficient means of accomplishing this is through a polar opposite. So where there is fear, love would be the appropriate balance. This is your dragon, the opposing principle of the self, your ego personality. Does this archetype have your conscious illumination? Does it integrate with the will of the self and of cosmic consciousness? This fire-breathing dragon must be observed and work with in order to share in the will of the self and rescue the white-dressed woman from capture, letting the pure water flow freely. The tale of this allegorical process tell of the situation at hand, as well as the method for handling it, through conscious integration and balance of the polar opposites. Deep within this stage or process, your internal soulmate appears. In Jungian psychology, this is known as the anima for males and the animus for females. Not only is this opposite a perfect example of your opposite sex, it also represents areas and aspects within you considered to be only for the opposite sex. This may represent certain types of thoughts, feelings, or actions you may be internally ashamed of if recognized or exposed. It should be noted how important this aspect of alchemy is for your continued achievement that you are able to balance a thought, feeling, or action against its polar opposite and reconcile between them equally to share of their cooperation, influence, and contribution. Now, you see, the archetype is a force, it has an autonomy. It can uh, suddenly seize you. It is like a seizure. Yeah. Uh, so, for instance, falling in love at first sight, yeah. that is such a case. You see, you have a certain image in yourself without knowing it of the woman, of the woman. Yeah. Now you see that girl, or at least a good imitation of your type. Yeah. And instantly you get a seizure and you are, you are calm. Yeah. And afterwards you may discover that it was a hell of a mistake. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or you see, a man is quite capable Oh, he's intelligent enough to see that that woman of his choice, as one says, it's not no choice, he has been captured. Yeah. You know, he sees that he sees no good at all, yeah. that he's a hell of a business. And 
And he, he tells me so. And he says, for God's sake, doctor, help me to get rid of that woman. He can't. He's, he's like clay in our fingers. And that is the archetype. That is so called archetype of the animal. Yeah, yeah. He, he thinks it is all his soul. Well, you know, that is a bit complicated, you know. Uh, the animal is, is an archetype, uh, an archetypal form expressing the fact that a man has a minority of feminine or female uh, genes. Yeah. And that is something that doesn't appear, it disappears in him, that is constantly present. And it works as a female in a man, therefore already in the 16th century, uh, the humanists have discovered that man has an anima. I see. And that uh, each man carries his female with himself, they say. Yeah. If you are having issues properly visualizing and bringing in the needed archetypes into your conscious illumination, try to observe your state of mind and determine if it needs adjustment. It is best to have a steady mind when working with alchemy, as well as mental focus. If you find it difficult to attain this, try this simple exercise. Begin by focusing on your breath. Do not try to change it, and just observe your breathing as natural and automatic. Begin to count your breaths for as long as possible. When you notice that you have stopped counting, start over. This can be applied to several methods, so you are encouraged to get creative with it, with the point of exercising the intellectual faculties and maintaining focus and a steady mind. You will eventually be able to count to a very high number and even be able to perform other tasks easily while continuing. Let's begin to address some of the things which will begin to occur within the energy system or subtle body of the alchemist. Alchemy is a lot like yoga in its perception of the energy structures of mankind as well as methods to bring balance to these centers and increase the energy flow among them. In the West, probably the most well-known symbol depicting the energy channels of Sol and Luna is the caduceus. This symbol has carried itself and its meaning throughout civilization for at least 5,000 years. The two opposing serpents represent the dual nature of subtle energies on the material plane, as spoke of earlier, with us being represented in the center as a display of this reconciliation between them. In the East, we see an identical representation in the Ida and Pingala, the two subtle energy channels recognized in yoga. Notice again, we have the center pillar, only this time it is known as Shashumna. In addition to alchemy, the West has an additional corresponding system in Kabbalah, where we have the left, right, and middle pillar. These two, can be seen as a manner or direction in which subtle energy can or does flow. Traveling down the tree of life or separat, this is the descent, so spirit can become coagulated with matter. You will see that nearly all teachings have to do with traveling back upward. However, the intent should not be to reject the matter or material plane, but to simply raise it up with you on your journey so matter can once again become spirit, a return to the source. In this way, a fully realized soul can become fully integrated with spirit and still exist on the material or earthly plane. You will also see this in Eastern traditions, where spirit enters the crown chakra, descends through the elementals, and comes to rest in the base or root chakra, and for many remains there. So in the East, the goal is to raise the matter or body back up to the crown chakra, gaining the highest level of consciousness. This process is the same in alchemy, of course, where the lead is the base or root chakra, and through mastery of the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual planes, one can raise their consciousness to the level of gold through the process of spiritual alchemy, which is done primarily through the application of heat, fire, or shin. As the energy rises naturally and begins to flow uninhibited, the perfect matrimony can occur, and is all about the mystical union. As you can see from the chart, the middle pillar stands as your mode of balance between forces. If you are male, balance your fire with water, and you will be air. And for females, balance your water with fire, and you will be air. In the elementals, 
when fire and water combine, you have air or vapor. Taking this path up the tree is the middle path. Not the left hand, not the right hand, but working in balance with the forces of nature and creation. All paths eventually lead to one destination. However, taking one polarized path can lead one through vices, hardened materialism, and thorns. While taking another polarized path can lead one through the clouds, high above and forgetting the importance or even some cases even hating or despising our material existence. One who is watery in nature may have a difficult time with intellect, and one who is fiery in nature may have a difficult time with emotions. The middle path allows one to walk with their head in the clouds with their feet planted firmly on the ground. This is a highly spiritual nature with grounded understanding of the importance of who we are and why we are here. This is a perfected union of spirit, volatile, and matter, fixed, often depicted by the androgene or hermaphrodite. Depictions of this is also seen in the Tarot, as the High Priestess, which corresponds to the hidden sphere of Doth on the Tree of Life in Kabbalah. Notice she is holding the Torah in her hands. In esoteric philosophy, the one became two in a mystical act of expansion and expression, the law of opposites and dynamic tension of the created universe. Yet we also see countless observations of the importance of making the two into one, a return to the source and its nature of being in pure and unconditional love. All duality seeks union, conscious or not, and this was an original intention of separation itself. As energy begins to move back upwards, we see an amplitude increase in the active current begin to take place in our energy channels. With this current increasing in both strength and frequency, known aspects of biological science can now be observed. Let's take this opportunity to actually look at some science taking place in hopes that we can gain a more rounded understanding of the process. Moving charges or currents produce magnetic fields. A constant current produces a constant magnetic field while a changing current produces a changing field. We can go the other way and use a magnetic field to produce a changing current as long as the magnetic field is changing. This is what induced EMF is all about. A steady changing magnetic field can induce a constant voltage while an oscillating magnetic field can induce an oscillating voltage. We should keep in mind these two facts. An oscillating electric field generates an oscillating magnetic field. An oscillating magnetic field generates an oscillating electric field. These two points are the key to understanding electromagnetic waves. An electromagnetic wave, such as a radio wave, propagates outward from the source at the speed of light. This means in practice that the source has created oscillating electric and magnetic fields perpendicular to each other that travel away from the source. The E and B fields, along with being perpendicular to each other, are perpendicular to the direction that the wave travels, meaning that an electromagnetic wave is a transverse wave. The energy of the wave is stored in the electric and magnetic fields. As human beings, we have a polarized nervous system, known as the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. It is a closed-loop electrical system to carry signals to and from the brain, other organs, and glands. As we have just learned, an oscillating current creates oscillating magnetic waves, and a constant current creates constant magnetic waves. This electrical system is dipole. Like a magnet itself, the field maintains a similar shape to what we see with iron filing experiments a torus-shaped electromagnetic field. Being grounded can therefore have an even more literal meaning as attaching an energy channel's ground will complete the circuit allowing for current and frequency of the wave to take shape. Just above the nervous system is found the pineal, which has a positive polarity, and the pituitary, which is negative. Once sufficient signal amplitude and activity level is reached in the nervous system, the EM waves of these two glands overlap. This creates a closed circuit between them and in return another torus-shaped electromagnetic field, which is the Ajna Chakra or third eye. This brings ethereal energy into a sense organ not normally stimulated in such a manner and increases the sensitivity and reception to the frequencies now available. Theories have begun to arise about the electromagnetic field of consciousness 
and how it is connected to our physical body. There even seems to be some consensus in the scientific community as to these claims. If it is true that our consciousness is electromagnetic in nature, it will enable science to move forward into the research of metaphysics. In consideration of this discussion, why is all of this important to alchemy? Something occurs within the alchemist at a certain realization that we actually have the ability to manipulate the reality around us. Even if in a subtle way, perhaps even by affecting the reality on the smallest of scales. Today, these phenomena are known in quantum mechanics to be a multitude of potential outcomes in relation to a system of observable probability. In scientific terms, it's called quantum indeterminacy. In 1937, an alchemist named Falconelli said, All the same, I can say this. You will not be aware that in present day official science, the part played by the observer becomes more and more important. Relativity, the principles of indeterminacy, demonstrates to the extent at which the observer today intervenes in all these phenomena. Fulcanelli was without a doubt speaking of the aspects we see in quantum physics today as being verifiable. Much of the talk today seems to validate what the alchemist did, especially in regards to higher consciousness. As you can see from the images, the higher the frequency of the EM waves, the more it is harmonic and resonates with the atomic nuclei and beyond into quantum levels. This is where all the magic happens in quantum mechanics. There are particles which seem to come in and out of existence or transform seamlessly to and from a wave. It appears when consciousness is powered by a fully active subtle body system that it has more effect on quantum indeterminacy. We indeed may be on the very brink of lending scientific credence to what has long been held to the alchemist or similar traditions, that the observer, or the alchemist in this case, can affect the outcomes on a quantum level. The process thus far has been all about self-awareness, which continues in its development as albedo moves into rubedo, and the consciousness which was originally volatile is becoming fixed. The etheric body is starting to be transmuted into the full light body, the flame of self-awareness is beginning to move down through the head into the middle and lower centers. Depending on a particular alchemical path, your focus may have been for it to enter the heart, and then the etheric rose comes back out of the heart center and enters the head center, illuminating the area between the pineal and the pituitary. This is one of several similarities between Christian and Rosicrucian traditions. When the focus of self-awareness occurs through the opening of the heart with unconditional love. This is a devotional path. For many traditions in the East, the path generally has more to do with the hands or actions. We see this in aspects of karma and that the proper action can help to aid in the free flow of energy through the channels once again. These make up the three major energy centers worked with in most traditions. Even though some may have more prominence than others, Nearly all have the goal of bringing in etheric energy and illuminating all of the centers eventually. When you have done your work with the needed effectiveness and sufficient energy passes through these centers, the blackness turns to whiteness and you have entered albedo and are entering the unity of the self, finally becoming whole. It was mentioned previously that consciousness could very well be electromagnetic in nature and could explain why the etheric body is charged when more energy is allowed to flow freely. This may also be responsible for not only what is known as auras to be more visible, but also allow one to see others' auras more clearly when taken into account the Ajna Chakra. As the etheric body makes up our consciousness, it is affected by these changes in a most spectacular way. Lucid dreaming, astral travel, and OBEs may become very frequent occurrences. Your consciousness is energizing and solidifying, becoming intricate, complex, and literally hardening into a stone. This stone is the key few are blessed enough to find each century, for it unlocks all doors. The ability to move the consciousness into the light body is a fundamental aspect of the Philosopher's Stone and is steeped and cloaked in the mysteries of eternal life. Because the consciousness is hardened into a stone and body of pure light, as the original physical body may fail, the self-awareness is eternal. 
This is the stone in all of its glory. It is the holy grail so many seek out with their heart. If you recall when we discussed the symbol of this elusive stone, we spoke of it being able to help a new initiate in decoding the alchemical imagery. Very quickly, you will gain an inner knowing of the different symbols and their meanings. However, an intellectual understanding lays an important groundwork for making associations in the consciousness. As you are most likely beginning to notice, the knowledge of the process and the imagery display an unmatched form of communicating details of such a subtle and spiritual science. The entire process is summed up with one image and it's doing its very best to describe a result. Describing what occurs when one gains the stone is not possible with human words or functions. However, it can be experienced on a personal level in a way that could never be spoken or written about. Your journey began in the blackness of Nigredo, yet here you are, having allowed your spirit to dissolve and then coagulate until Albedo has given way to Ribedo, the redness. This is nearly the completion of the great work and the opposing principles within you are fully reconciled. Do not be surprised or worried if you take a step back along the way. In most cases it is for the better and passing through these stages is much easier the second time. After you have reached this point, remember, one door opens many and although your journey has required endurance, there is something major at the forefront of your soul and consciousness. The journey is not over, there is still one union that makes up the true purpose of them all and is the completion of this alchemical genesis. It is now time to come full circle and experience the true source of all and return to it when it's time. The union of opposing principles within you is only part of the reason of our existence and is a stepping stone for fulfilling it to its entirety. The mystical union of opposites between the personal and cosmic scale, that is to say the microcosm and macrocosm, is none other than the self and the one. As above, so below, we see this process occur all the way down to the atomic level. In physics, it's what is known as covalent bonding, where elementals may combine due to deficiencies that each have. In addition to the previous discussion, we wanted to also provide a safe and reliable manner to get started with laboratory work on the physical plane, serving to strengthen the bond that you are laying down in the subconscious. Just try to remember, you are having to deprogram aspects that have been solidified or latent since around the time you are given a name. So performing laboratory work is a very beneficial way to ensure that the messages are making it to the needed faculties. There are a couple types of physical alchemy to work with as well as many methods. For the purposes discussed here, we will not be going into any advanced work. It would require a great deal of precautions and go beyond the current scope of things. In what is known as mineral alchemy, you have what correlates to the advanced stages of alchemy, known as the great work. You should begin with the physical work which is relevant to where you are at this time, otherwise it will be far less effective. In the beginning of our journey, we have what is known as the lesser work, in which we begin to work with plant alchemy and the area of spiritual and physical medicine called spagyrics. These are the beginning stages of the physical work that is to be performed on the physical plane as experiments. As in quantum physics, where we are increasingly seeing the role that the observer plays in scientific experiments, so we also have with alchemy, where the alchemists themselves are seen with great importance to their experiments. In fact, this is what separates the creation of an elixir from that of merely a tincture which can be found at many health food stores. It is this interaction with the subtle energies of the alchemist which greatly adds to an elixir's spiritual and medicinal benefit. Remember the motto solvate coagula. This is put into practice here. The plant or herb used contains a dual nature, its soul or essence, and its body or matter. You will use or add spirit, in this case alcohol, to separate them for purification and later to hold them together when coagulated. In the creation of a true and basic elixir in plant alchemy, you will do the following, but first, you will need some materials to get started. A mortar and pestle, or something similar, for grinding the herb. One ounce of the herb of your choice, according to the qualities of healing you are creating the elixir for. For example, the sun you will use an herb that is ruled by the sun. 
an eight ounce jar, such as a mason jar, a bottle of grain alcohol or high proof vodka for separation, a glass pan for calcination, a fine filter for separation of the liquid from the plant matter, coffee filters were due. A funnel will also make the transfer for the solution easy, and a bottle, preferably with a dropper, for dispensing the elixir. When you are ready to begin, read through the following steps several times and familiarize yourself with them. This is also done to enter a certain mind state for the metaphysical operations you are about to undertake. Let's say you are creating an elixir with solar properties. Begin first with a prayer or meditation on the qualities of the solar principle and ask that these qualities may be perfected in you through your experiment. Hold this state and begin. Take an herb which is ruled by the sun, such as eyebright, during the day ruled by the sun, which is Sunday, and during an hour ruled by the sun, and place the herb in a mortar and pestle. Begin to grind down the herb to a fine powder, meditating on your salt or body being used for the work. Your soul is being used for your intent and are being blended with the energies of the herb through your work. At the same time, the process and vice versa is being done to you, the union of both yourself and the herb with its qualities. When the herb is a powder, it is now ready for efficient extraction. Take the powder and place it in a jar, pouring an equal amount of alcohol into the jar while meditating on the fact that you are causing separation of the soul from the body of the herb, while at the same thing is happening to you so that the soul and body can be purified. Shake vigorously and cover the top of the jar with plastic wrap, then screw down the lid around the wrap. This forms a tight seal and ensures that the vapor does not come in contact with any metal. You can also use rubber bands if no lids are available. Place the solution somewhere away from sunlight and allow sitting for at least two weeks, or even better, use the alchemist month of 40 days. Switch the jar around every few days to ensure proper penetration of the spirit being used. After sufficient time has passed, the soul of the herb will be fully dissolved and suspended in spirit and the dead matter or caput mortem can now be separated and purified as a salt. Place the filter into a funnel or use the corner of a plastic bag and begin to pour the solution out of the jar and into a bottle. To be the most efficient, you may want to place the soaked plant material into the filter and wring out any remaining solution. The solution should be a dark color with most of the bright green color having faded away, the impurities left behind of the soul attached to the matter. Be sure to properly label your elixir and then store away from sunlight. You now have a solution of the plant soul suspended in spirit and it is time to perform calcination. This is done in order to purify the salt or body so it can be rejoined with its soul. Throughout this process, you have been closely observing the stages that spirit, soul, and body have been working with the plant. Through resonance, you are attuning to these stages yourself with your subtle energy. At the same time work is being performed below, it is being done above as well. Remember, you are in nigrado and beginning to look at the constituent parts of the whole individually. To begin the next stage, it is good to have adequate ventilation, or even better, perform the task outdoors as smoke will be created. On the appropriate ruling day and hour of the herb, put the soaked plant material on a fire-safe glass pan or similar container, then place your fire or will on the matter. The spirit will act as a fuel and ignite the calcination process, quickly blackening the matter. Meditate on the aspect of placing your consciousness on your impurities. Stir occasionally with a metal rod or butter knife until the spirit has burned off and the matter is dry and blackened. You may see small spots of whiteness and purity beginning to appear. Take the blackened matter and place it in your mortar and pestle, grinding the salts to a fine powder and breaking it down further into its parts. Place the powder back in the pan and drip a small amount of spirit or alcohol on it and place fire against it again, allowing it to calcine as before. Repeat this process as needed until the powder has become as white as possible. Observe closely during the calcination process and meditate on our previous discussion concerning applying heat to ourselves. 
This helps burn off impurities of the soul and body during Nigrado, until we begin to see the whiteness appear through the blackness and enter albedo. The pure white salts can now be stored away from sunlight and are ready to use. Again, be sure to label appropriately. If you are ready to complete the process and begin taking your elixir, begin on the ruling day and hour for the herb being used in the elixir and place a pinch of the salts in a spoon. Use the dropper to soak the salts with the soul or essence of the herb and the spirit will coagulate the soul and body to recombine completely purified. Meditate for a moment concerning the completion of this process being done. You have brought it from the beginning to this point over the past couple weeks and have captured the process into a consumable talisman to take in its subtle energies. You can now take the elixir. In all likelihood, you will not see any effects of the talisman at first. Alchemical or spagyric tinctures are very subtle. You will see the benefits quickly of anything related to the physical properties of the herb being used. However, the spiritual properties may begin to manifest in other areas such as meditation or dream states first. The important thing to note is that you have fully begun the appropriate process for initiation and started to awaken your subtle faculties. To help you develop in a balanced way, it is suggested that you create an appropriate tincture for each day of the seven days prior to beginning taking them. This is most easily done by having all of your supplies together and creating them one per day, each day, beginning with Sunday. As stated previously, you should have a working knowledge of the herbs you plan to use in your elixir. If you would like to get started with the ones shown here, which are safe unless you are pregnant or nursing, their names are as follows. Eyebright, a memory aid and anti-inflammatory. Watercress, an antioxidant, an expectorant, and digestive aid. Watercress also has anti-angliogenic and cancer suppressing properties. Basil, an antioxidant, anti-cancer, antiviral, and antimicrobial. Basil also reduces platelet aggregation. Fennel, a gastrointestinal tonic and anti-flatulent. Lemon balm, an antibacterial and antiviral. Passion flower, a sedative and analgesic. And horsetail, an antioxidant. As you can see, aside from the subtle and etheric effects on your consciousness, you have something quite amazing in the physical properties of these herbs. One can clearly see the benefits of this particular selection and how the ruling planets balance out the effects and create a truly synergistic medicinal framework. It is recommended to go ahead and begin the creation of tinctures when you start the process spoke of earlier. When you are working with laboratory alchemy, such as in the creation of tinctures and elixirs, it is very important to bring into conscious focus the spiritual work being done. At the same time, when you are working on inner development, try to also focus on the work needing to be done on the material plane. The inner and outer work are to coincide with each other. Keeping this aspect in mind will aid in the ability to experience a mystical union. As above, so below, this correlation will never falter. Keep in mind that we have only gone into detail concerning the initial stages and there is much more to learn about the great work. It is simply too extensive to cover in one setting, nor would it be beneficial. Alchemy, as well as alchemical aspects of similar traditions, is all about the process, and this rings true in nearly every area of the art. The great work is just that, many times as a lifelong pursuit, and is written about by the many who have come before describing its level of commitment. As the ageless alchemical motto reveals, pray, study, read, read, and read. It is our hope that we have at least provided somewhat of a systematic approach to spiritual alchemy and provided some of the tools needed to begin in the great work. You have learned a few of the key steps to begin working in the art and how you can utilize it on a practical basis. As we move towards the mystical union, we see the true beauty that alchemy is in its wholeness and essence. Will you take up the challenge that alchemy presents to you? 
The world needs more individuals rising to the occasion to transmute themselves to a higher form of existence and to help others do the same in whatever capacity possible. A skilled alchemist can transmute within their sphere of influence. However, many of us can truly perform a global transmutation through application of spiritual alchemy on a larger scale. Therefore, remember as we grow on our journey and our path, let's try to always be in service of each other at the same time, and we will all grow together. Everyone accomplishes. 